who the Rajputs are. In the Institutes of Manu, the ancient lawgiver of India, Hindu society is divided into four classes. The first is that of the powerful class of the Kshatriyas, or warriors, who are the rulers and temporal guardians of the nation, the second is the Brahmins, or clergy, to whom is entrusted the spiritual welfare, of the Hindus, the third class comprises the Vaishyas, or mercantile population, whose duty it is to watch over the agricultural and commercial interests of the people, and at the last of the social scale come the Sudras, who are hereditary servants and manual laborers. This explicit classification defines the position of the Rajputs, who as the lineal descendants of the ancient Kshatriyas, are the hereditary, royal warriors, and the admitted nobility of India. Their claim to be among the oldest ruling dynasties in the world is incontestable, as shown by Colin James Todd, in his book, Annals and Antiquities of Rajasthan, he writes, if we compare the antiquity and illustrious descent of the dynasties which have ruled, and some which continue to rule, the small sovereignties of Rajasthan, with many of celebrity in Europe, superiority will often attach to the Rajput. From the most remote periods, we can trace nothing ignoble, nor any vestige of vassal origin. Reduced in power, circumscribed in territory, compelled to yield much of their splendor, and many of the dignities of birth, they have not abandoned an iota of the pride and high bearing arising from a knowledge of their illustrious and regal descent. On this principle the various revolutions in the Rana's family never encroached, and the mighty Jangir himself, the emperor of the Mughals, became, like Caesar, the commentator of the history of the tribe of Sisodia. The potentate of the twenty-two satrapies of Hind dwells with proud complacency on this Rajput king having made terms with him. He praises heaven that what his immortal ancestor Baber, the founder of the Mughal dynasty, failed to do, the project in which Humayun had also failed, and in which the illustrious Akbar, his father, had but partially succeeded, was reserved for him. It is pleasing to peruse in the commentaries of these conquerors, Baber and Jangir, their sentiments with regard to these princes. We have the evidence of Sir Thomas Rowe, the ambassador of James to Jangir, as to the splendor of this race, it appears throughout their annals and those of their neighbors. The Rajput princes of India, therefore, hold a very different position to the mushroom princes, belonging to the newly created royal houses of Europe, whose titles were originally conferred to suit somebody's convenience or circumstances, such as those of the Napoleonic, Servian, or Swedish dynasty. Nor do the Rajas and Maharajas, manufactured indiscriminately by the British government, stand on any sort of equality with the Rajput nobles, who are not dependent for their titles on past or present sovereigns. Few even of the peers of Great Britain can boast with them of a royal ancestry. The Rajput princes of India trace their descent from the ancient emperors and rulers of India, and, though politically subordinate to the imperial government, they have a hereditary claim to royal authority. The question may arise why all the ruling princes of India at the present time are not acknowledged as Rajputs. The answer is, because the sacred law, as well as the laws of Hindustan, admit only those as Rajputs, who are descended from the 36 royal Kshatriya clans mentioned in the sacred books, the Puranas, and in the two great Indian epic poems, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. Sir Alfred Lyell, in his famous work, Asiatic Studies, Religious and Social, speaks of the ruling dynasties of Rajputana, the most ancient families of the purest clans. To the Sisodia clan, the oldest and purest blood in India, and the states of Udaipur, Benswara, Dungarpur, Pratabgar, and Shapura. As to the distinction between a self-styled chief and a hereditary king of the blood royal Sir Alfred writes, no ordinary reader would suspect a radical difference of constitution between the Maratha group and the Rajput group, between the state ruled by Maharaja Sindhya, for instance, and the conterminous state of Jaipur or Udaipur. Any difference existing between the two states would probably be assumed in England to mean this, that the Maratha prince ruled over Marathas, and the Rajput chief over Rajputs. But this would be all wrong, for there are very few Marathas in the dominion of Sindhya, the Maratha prince, 
while he probably has more Rajput subjects than the Rajput chief of Udaipur, the oldest Rajput territory. The real difference is that Sindhya is the representative of the single family of a successful captain of armies who annexed in the last century all the territory he could lay hands on, and whose son finally encamped so long in one place that his camp grew into his capital some sixty years ago, while the Rajput chief is the head of a clan, which has for many centuries been lords of the soil, which now makes up the Udaipur state's territory. And this distinction of origin represents a vast distinction in the whole constitution and political classification of the two states. Sindhya is a despot of the ordinary Asiatic species, ruling absolutely the lands which his ancestor seized by the power of a mercenary army, but the Rajput chieftain is a very different personage of a much rarer and more instructive type, politically and socially, in so much that some accurate description of this type may be useful and interesting even to general readers in England. Thirty-six royal clans referred to above are classified as follows. 1. The Suryavamsis, or Ragyavamsis, the clans of the Solar Dynasty, descended through Manu, Ikshvaku, Harishchandra, Raghu, Dasaratha, and Rama. 2. The Chandravamsis, or Somavamsis, the clans of the Lunar Dynasty, descended through Yayati, Deva. Nasha, Puru, Yadu, Kuru, Pandu, Krishna. Yudhishthir and. 3. The Agnikulas, the clans of the Fire Dynasty, descended from Agnipala, Swatcha, Maulan, Gyulunsar, Ajpala and Dola Rai. The Rajputs, true to their descent, are born warriors, and no family of the human race ever possessed so liberal a portion of that essence of reckless daring, called chivalry by poets and romancers, as the Rajputs. Chivalry and heroism are as much a part of their blood as honor and pride. To write at any length about the Rajputs is to relate the deeds and vicissitudes of one of the noblest and most ancient of known races and to enliven many pages of the world's history with startling episodes of romance. Their fame is recorded on every page of the stirring annals of the Rajput states of India. The glory of their mighty achievements is reflected in the works of every chronicler of Europe and Asia, beginning with the father of historians, Herodotus, who was the first to allude to their heroic courage. The Rajput Code of Honor calls for a very high standard of character, and this high standard has been uninterruptedly maintained is shown by their present ready response to the call to arms. The Rajputs, both in their lives and aspirations, remain true to the traditions of their race, and are characterized in all their ways, as their ancestors, before them, by the pride and dignity that betoken men of destiny. Napoleon once exclaimed, Give me a few men of destiny to create mine, give me mine, and I create France's. Today these men of destiny from the East, each and all of them, from humble warrior, to mighty prince, from mighty prince, to mightier, Rana, are going to help create a new destiny for Europe.